I still recall working my way through a book as a child and making that astounding discovery that an author was speaking to me. As a librarian, I get to revisit that feeling every time I attend this banquet. I can't think of a better way to spend an evening than with a thousand book lovers and friends as we hear from and celebrate their distinguished book creators. <laughs> Yay, indeed. <laughs> I welcome every one of you, wherever you are seated, whether your first banquet or your 50th, together tonight we listen. It is now my honor and delight to welcome the president of the American Library Association. This is a colleague and book lover who among her many presidential duties and initiatives this past year has shown us how truly transformative and essential libraries are. Everyone, please put your hands together for Julie Todaro. Thank you. So who knew that giving a mayor an opinion would get me in so much trouble? I was respectful and honest, and when I gave my call this morning for you to go back into battle, that's the way we do it. But we don't miss an opportunity to speak up and to provide uh, information. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> So in 1977, so if you were not born by then, I do not want to hear that. In 1977, I had the fortune as a children's librarian to be on a committee in Texas to put together a little award called the Blue Bonnet Award. I was honored to do so, and when we finished that award, I was asked to speak at Rice University about the importance of awards, and Zena Sutherland was in the audience. Zena Sutherland, which was enormous for me. Because of that, she appointed me as the member of the 1978 79 Newberry Caldecott Committee. This was two years before the Newberry and the Caldecott were separated, and of course the Wilder was completely separate. My books were, you can do the math, The Weston Game. I know, I love that book. And one of the most beautiful children's books, The Girl Who Loved Wild Horses. So I love those. I was honored to serve on that committee. Uh, we had some fascinating people. We had a children's librarian walk out and quit the committee in the space. Yeah, it was, it was good times. Maybe it's me. I don't know. I think it's me. But we had a fascinating time. We had to wear brown paper covers around our books because the publishers had our faces and then they would look to see which book we were carrying when we walked through the exhibit. So we think you still do that maybe, I'm not sure. It was an exciting time and it, it, I met Augusta Baker there. She was on my committee as well. And uh, we had heard it rumored that someone had walked out the year before or said they would be there until they voted her book in. I think she's in the audience tonight, but I'm not <laughs> sure. Thank you all so much. Many years ago, I was sitting where you are, and it's daunting to be here and to be welcoming you to this event. I've always been honored to have a career that includes being a children's and a young adult librarian, and that continues to be on my resume and continues to serve me well as I speak out and be knowledgeable about the kinds of services and resources that are critical because the next poet laureate could come from your library. Thank you so much. Good evening. What do a remarkable young artist a knitting grandmother seeking solitude, bugs speaking their own language, dancers in New Orleans Congo Square, and a cat have in common. Would you have guessed book characters in the most distinguished illustrated children's books published in 2016? Would you have guessed this year's Randolph Caldecott Award and Honor Books? 
Chairing this year's Caldecott Committee provided me with the opportunity to discuss, debate, and deliberate picture books published last year in the United States with a group of dedicated and articulate children's literature professionals. I am proud to call them my colleagues, my friends, and my Caldecott family. It has been an honor to work with them, and please allow me to introduce you to them at this time. Please hold your applause until all of the committee members are standing. And Caldecott family, please stand as I call your name. Martin Blasco. Miriam Lang Budin. Marion L. Creamer. Erica Dean Glenn. Stacy Dillon. Brian D. Hart, Holly Jin, Lauren Eminette Lang, Susan Z. Melcher, Janet C. Mumford, Lori Reese, Lisa Von Dresik, Ashley Waring, and Brian E. Wilson. Thank you. The Randolph Caldecott Medal is awarded annually to the illustrator of the most distinguished picture book for children published in the United States in the preceding year. The 2017 Caldecott Committee chose four honor books. In alphabetical order by title, they are Do Is Talk. <laughs> Written and illustrated by Carson Ellis, published by Candlewick Press. A diverse community of anthropomorphic bugs is intrigued by an unfurling spout. Carson Ellis deftly depicts the mysteries of life in an imaginary, natural world. Through intricate details and the witty humor of a made-up language, Do Is Talk is a treasure trove of visual and linguistic literacy. Carson, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for Do Is Talk. Freedom in Congo Square. <laughs> Illustrated by R. Gregory Christie, written by Carol Boston Weatherford, published by Little B Books, an imprint of Bonnier Publishing, USA. As they work throughout the week, slaves look forward to their afternoon of music, hope, and community in Congo Square, New Orleans. Our Gregory Christie's folk art inspired paint and collage images powerfully capture the emotions of this little known historical event. Vibrant color and brilliant use of line heighten the impact of the rhyming couplets. Greg, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for Freedom in Congo Square. Leave me alone. <laughs> Illustrated and written by Vera Broskel, published by Roaring Book Press, an imprint of Macmillan's Children's Publishing Group. At the end of her rope, Granny is desperate for time alone to finish knitting sweaters for a house filled with dozens of rambunctious children. Vera Broskel's expressive watercolor and cartoon art 
presents a genre-breaking journey for Granny from taking the traditional forest setting to the mountains, to the moon, and beyond. Vera, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for Leave Me Alone. They all saw a cat. <laughs> Illustrated and written by Brendan Wenzel, published by Chronicle Books. A cat's walk through the world becomes a surprise-filled exploration of perspective and empathy. As the feline encounters a variety of creatures, the thoughtful composition, paired with spare language and repetition, focuses on each individual's perception of it. Brendan Wenzel's use of a range of art materials reinforces the idea that the essence of a cat might be in the eye of the beholder. Brendan, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for They All Saw a Cat. And finally, the recipient of the 2017 Randolph Caldecott Medal for the most distinguished picture book for children is Javaka Steptoe for Radiant Child, the story of young artist Jean Michel Basquiat. Illustrated and written by Javaka Steptoe. <laughs> Published by Little Brown Books for Young Readers, a division of Hachette Book Group. Like Jean-Michel Basquiat's work, Javaka Steptoe's illustrations radiate energy and immediacy. A patchworked canvas of scavenged wood, painted and collaged with photos and images of human anatomy, evokes the improvatory nature of Basquiat's art. Radiant Child resonates with emotion that connects Javaka Steptoe with Basquiat and Basquiat with young readers, making the artist approachable and relatable to children on a variety of levels. Javaka Steptoe, on behalf of the 2017 Caldecott Committee, it is a privilege to recognize you and your achievement and to present you with the Randolph Caldecott Medal for Radiant Child the story of young artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. It says at the top of my speech, this is six minutes and 18 seconds. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <coughs> A Genius Child by Langston Hughes. This is a song for a genius child. Sing it softly, for the song is wild. Sing it softly, for the song is wild. Sing it softly as ever you can, lest the song gets out of hand. Nobody loves a genius child. Can you love an eagle, tame or wild? Wild or tame, can you love a monster of frightening name? Nobody loves a genius child. Kill him and let his soul run wild. This poem was read at Jean-Michel Basquiat's memorial service by his friend Freddie Brathwaite, 
also known as Fab Five Freddy, host of Yo! MTV Raps. It sums up the love-hate relationship many of us have with bringers of change. Our connections with revolutionaries are often uncomfortable and hard to deal with and are often filled with abuse and struggles for power in an attempt to maintain the status quo. But when their job is done, we celebrate their lives as if we were behind them all the way. Imagine what, it would, what would happen if we were really behind them all the way. 12 years ago, I decided to write a book about Jean-Michel Basquiat. I was at the Brooklyn Museum in 2005 at the Basquiat exhibit, standing in front of a piece called The Jawbone of an Ass. The title referenced the act of a, of a biblical, uh, biblical hero, Samson, chopping down 1,000 Philistines, a perennial enemy of the Jewish people with the jawbone of a donkey. The painting itself has an untraditional frame made of four slaps, slats of wood tied at the corners with a string. The canvas is draped over the frames and its surface is separated into three sections reminiscent of the Holy Trinity by a large yellow rectangular area in the middle. This yellow area is filled with names that allude to historic struggles for power and agency. Names of those considered heroes are given crowns by Basquiat. In the upper left is a drawing of a black man from the waist up. Above him written the words thinker. Beneath him painted a blue crown. All the way to the right a jumble of cartoon line drawings depicts conflict. A policeman welding a jawbone, snakes and bombs, and two boxers, one white, one black, slugging it out. My description does not do the actual artwork justice. But what struck me about it, about this piece of artwork, was Basquiat's use of history, how he tied the past and the present together with clarity. It was immediate, straightforward, yet complex. That would be my first time standing in front of a work of his, really studying it, really seeing Basquiat. This experience, as well as the excitement surrounding the exhibit of his work, led to a fleeting thought. It would be really cool if I did a children's book around him. The idea lay dormant for five years until 2010, when Radiant Child, a documentary by, a filmmaker, Tamar, by t filmmaker Tamara Davis, brought it back to the forefront of my mind. Reinvigorated, I began searching his life and was able to find what I called the meat of the story. The juicy, mouth-watering piece that you can't do without. It's what your, what your mind sinks its teeth into, what holds the story together. Sorry, vegetarians. <laughs> For me, the meat was this Basquiat quote. I say my mother gave me the primary things. The artwork comes from her. These words let me know that I was going to create a story about the love between a mother and her son. As I began to learn about Basquiat's life, I found that our lives have many parallels. Living in Brooklyn, hanging out in the village, creating art and mental illness. I learned that his life was rich with experiences and subject matters relevant to, to, to today's youth and families, such as drug addiction, immigration, poetry, art activism, or what we call artivism, racism, hip hop culture, and graffiti. I also found that while there was a great love for his work, 
People were often conflicted about giving him credit for his genius. There was a comfort in the narrative that he was a poor, uneducated, wild child from the streets, that his artistry was not worthy of being discussed because it was a fluke, and that his imagery came from drug addiction or mental illness delusions. The truth is that Basquiat was raised in a two-parent home, which they owned until his mother became sick. He spoke three languages and went to private and public schools. His father owned several businesses before becoming an accountant at Penguin. <laughs> <laughs> and he fr frequently played tennis on the weekend. The, the development of Basquiat's style began as a child and continued to develop into, into his adulthood. There are no first-hand accounts showing that his art was a product of drugs or mental illness. And as a side note, no one ever mentioned that there was also a highly prevalent drug culture in America. So it was not like he was the only one. And also this drug culture during the 80s was enabled by government policy. Oh, sorry. The truth is that you cannot discuss modern art without Basquiat. Art was his breath. It was his act of love, and he touched people deeply. This is not to say that he had no problems or angst, but there has been a double standard in the telling of his story. It saddens and angers me to think how many young artists of color have discovered Jean-Michel Basquiat have been moved by his work only to be told he was a lucky drug addict at the right place at the right time. This type of character lynching is not something of the past. I have personally experienced the rewriting of my history by a journalist article filled with blatant lies, focused more on himself and his comfort level of what he thought I was than rather who I was or am. We have come a long way, but black and brown bodies are still facing the repercussions of full frontal and systematic racism, sometimes with their lives. We still have far to go. So why write a book about such a controversial figure? Because we live in a complicated world, and children's books can open up spaces for young people to learn lessons that help pre prepare them for their future. Children's books are safe containers to discuss any number of difficult topics with their, with their caretakers or loved ones. They create opportunities for children seeking understanding and solutions for real life situation. To know that they're not alone and to speak their truth. They, are op they open spaces for children to develop empathy and understanding and to feel pride in their culture, heritage, and experiences. Jean-Michel Basquiat's story teaches children and all of us, that life has struggles, many that we can do nothing about, but we also have power in how we face them. And most important, it teaches us that we all have value. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The job of a child is to learn as much as possible about the world through new eyes that cast no judgment. It is not that they can not handle inconvenient truths. 
It is we as adults who shy away from controversial topics and feel uncomfortable and even ashamed. When we tell lies or omit truths about life to children, they are filled with unrealistic expectations of the world. We create angry adults that do terrible things to themselves and others, and the truth creates peace. <laughs> <laughs> just, just as a, a side note, whenever I go to schools, my number one rule is anything can happen. <laughs> so you just have to flow with it. <laughs> my father wrote as a way to heal himself and to value others. And now I do the same. Sloppy, ugly, and sometimes weird is a metaphor for our lives, our struggles, and the value that we all hold. While a life may be of no interest at first glance, on closer inspection, there is always more to learn, more lessons to take note of. When we pay attention to others, we pay attention to ourselves. When we find beauty in others, we find beauty in ourselves. By being a witness to the sloppy, ugly, but somehow still beautiful beings around us, we learn who we really are. We are not the sum of our faults or our strengths. Those are transit transitory things. We are each doing the best we can with the tools we have been given against the challenges that we face. We all desire love and happiness, and we all are deserving. How we treat one another is what distinguishes us. I keep doing that. So let us speak truth at all times, even when it is difficult or it is painful so that we do not fill our children's bags with the weight of what we carry. Fighting racism, sexism, classism, poverty, and any of the other woes of humanity is like fighting hunger. It is not satiated with one meal. It is not solved by, one, by giving a man a fish. It is everyday work. That we, much that we must teach people how to do. We cannot be satisfied with one victory and think that the battle is over. Until the struggle becomes indistinguishable from the way we live our lives, these pestilences will always be plagues. Committee members, publishing companies, everyone listening or reading this speech, I ask that we all keep fighting and that we take this attitude with us into our day-to-day -day business. Please do not feel overwhelmed. We can all pick an individual focus and in, in this way, everything will be accomplished. You will become better and we will become better. I would like to thank Jean-Michel Basquiat, my agent Edward Neckerslummer, Cindy Egan, Connie Sue, Deirdre Jones, Sahu, Saho Fuji, Jen Keenan, Phil Caminetti, <laughs> Annie McDowell, Erica Schwartz, Cericia Fennell, Victoria Stapleton, Jenny Choi, Megan Tingley, everyone at Little Brown for Young Readers for being supportive and preparing a space for me to sit and focus and work. My girlfriend, Azure, Dr. Trina Lynn Yearwood, my mother, father, and family members, and a host of other friends and family members who have supported me in my life and on this project through your words and through 
getting to work in the studio, <laughs> painting blocks for me. Um, I would also like to thank Leo and Diane Dillon. <laughs> Jerry Pinkney. My father, John Steptoe. Jerry Pinckney and Leo and Diane Dillon were the only other African-American people to receive the Caldecott Award before me. And there are a host of other African-Americans that have received Caldecott honors. And I just wanna take a moment to think about that. In my heart, and because of the history of this country, there are times that we've had to face racism. And the silver medals that were received by African Americans, in my heart, those are gold medals. It is on their shoulders I stand. And I would lastly like to thank the 2017 Caldecott Committee for seeing the value in the story and for honoring me with such a distinguished award. Thank you. What a thrill it is to be here with all of you to celebrate the best in publishing for children. This past year, I had the honor of serving as the chair of the 2017 Newberry Committee, or NC17, as we have taken to calling ourselves, <laughs> and working alongside a peerless group of ardent, careful, curious, dutiful, exacting, fearless, genial, insightful, magnanimous, open, particular, passionate, smart, tireless readers, that's 14 adjectives in case you lost count, I'm going to introduce them to you now. I will read their names. They will stand and remain standing, and you will hold your applause <laughs> until I've called them all. Ready? Tony A. Carmack. Kimberly Castle Alberts. Betsy Fraser. Elaine M. Fultz. Krishna Grady. Matthew Kruger. Laura Lutz, April Maza, Daniel L. Meyer, Jean Nelson, Marianne H. Owen, Brandy Sanchez, Shauna M. Sojoyner, and Jamie Watson. This year, the Newberry Committee chose three honor books in alphabetical order by title and author as it happens. They are Freedom Over Me, 11 Slaves, Their Lives and Dreams Brought to Life by Ashley Bryan. Published by Caitlin Bluey Books, Athenaeum Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon & Schuster children's publishing. Ashley Bryan has taken 11 names and price tags from an 1828 Georgia plantation appraisal and fashioned from them a series of inspired, affecting, and deeply personal poems that are both an indictment of an ugly piece of our collective history and a celebration of the human spirit, calling children to gather and witness and remember. Ashley, please come forward to receive your Newberry Honor Citation for Freedom Over Me.
Ooh, here we go. By Langston Hughes. I play it cool. I play it cool. And I dig all jive. And I dig all jive. That's the reason I stay alive. That's the reason I stay alive. I live and learn. My motto as I live and learn. Is dig and be dug in return. The Inquisitor's Tale, or The Three Magical Children and Their Holy Dog, by Adam Gidwitz, published by Dutton Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers, a division of Penguin Random House. Edited by Julie Strauss-Gable, president and publisher of Dutton Books for Young Readers. She's having a good night. By turns intimate and epic, hilarious and heart-wrenching, Adam Gidwitz's Chaucerian escapade traces an unlikely friendship across medieval France as three youngsters and a sainted dog defy dastardly monks, foil farting dragons, and evade one enigmatic inquisitor, all to do nothing short of rescuing human understanding from the literal fires that would destroy it. Adam, please come forward to receive your Newbery Honor Citation for The Inquisitor's Tale. <laughs> Wolf Hollow by Lauren Wolk published by Dutton Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers, a division of Penguin Random House, edited by Julie Strauss-Gable, president and publisher of Dutton Books for Young Readers. <laughs> Distinguished by taut plotting, indelible character painting, and unspeakably beautiful sentences, Wolf Hollow explores one girl's introduction into the ambiguities of adulthood as Annabelle faces down the gossip, persecution, and senseless violence consuming her small Pennsylvania town and works through her own complicated relationship with the truth. Lauren, please come forward to receive your Newbery Honor Citation for Wolf Hollow. Now, the winner of the 2017 Newbery Medal for the most distinguished book for children is The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. <laughs> Published by Algonquin Young Readers, an imprint of Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill, a division of Workman Publishing, edited by Elise Howard, publisher and editor, Algonquin Young Readers. The Girl Who Drank the Moon, the first piece of high fantasy to win the Newbery since 1985, is at its core a family story, telling the tale of Zan, a centuries-old witch not nearly as evil as her reputation, Glurk, an amorphous swamp monster of colossal wisdom, Firion, a pint-sized dragon with a dragon-sized heart, and Luna, their little girl, accidentally enmagicked and their everything. 
but it is about so much more, too, about blind obedience and ultimate sacrifice, about swallowing your sorrow and claiming your power. It's incredibly ambitious, with two or three more narrative threads than ought to be humanly manageable, but <laughs> hers is a feat of genius, and this is a sweeping, thrumming, heart-filling masterpiece. Kelly, on behalf of the 2017 Newberry Medal Selection Committee, it is my great honor to acknowledge your distinguished achievement and present to you the John Newberry Medal for the girl who drank the moon. Issues here. I was worried. <laughs> Give me a sec. Okay. Okay, I'm good. Um, uh, I can do this. Hi, guys. Um, I only just learned today that it's a real medal. Nobody tells me anything. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. Are you having a nice time? I hope so. <laughs> All right. So, nobody writes a book alone. This may come as a shock to some of you, those of you who aren't writers. I mean, we look like we're alone, don't we? In our tea-stained, ripped jeans and um, the sun-starved dullness of our faces when it's clear that we haven't left our offices in days. I mean, I've heard. But seriously, we can't do this by ourselves, which means um, before I can talk about all this business, um, I need to say thank you to some people. First of all, I wouldn't be here at all if it weren't for Lindsay Davis, who I just met today and then I promptly burst into tears, uh, who is not only the first person who said yes, um, but the first person who championed my very first book. That first yes in a writer's life means all the difference in the world. And it still does. It still does forever. And speaking of first yeses, I also would be remiss if I didn't also thank the effervescently beautiful Nancy Conescu and the whole team at my very first publisher, Little Brown, who brought my first book into the world and supported the steps that led me here. And so thank you. I really appreciate you guys. Also, clearly, I need to thank Stephen Malk, my amazing agent, who hoisted my career on his back and has carried it tirelessly across deserts and dark forests and high mountains and perhaps even into outer space. I'm not entirely sure about that last bit, but I wouldn't put it past him. My writing is better because of Steve, mostly because I'm constantly trying to impress him. <laughs> I sure as heck wouldn't be here without Elise Howard, who, if you don't know this already, is a wacky super genius and literally writes about everything, including, by the way, when she literally ordered me to write this very book. Let this be a lesson to all of you. Always listen to Elise. <laughs> uh, and helping Elise is the entire team at Algonquin Young Readers. Um, uh, the boundlessly joyful Trevor Ingerson, Eileen Lawrence, <laughs> Sarah Albert, Brooke Chuka, Chuka, and many others. So many of you who, have all buoyed, who are all buoyed up by the support of, sorry, <laughs> by the support from Workman Publishing. Dan Reynolds, I gotta say, you are steering a hell of a ship. Thank you. I wouldn't be here for, for my writing group, The Black Sheep, Steve Bresnoff, Curtis Scaletta, Car Carlin Coleman, Jody Cromie, Brian Bliss, and Christopher Lincoln, who refused to allow me to give up on this book uh, or any of my books and insisted that I continue, even emailing the manuscript that I thought that I had erased back to me over and over and over again, saying, hey, dummy, don't you know how email works? <laughs> even though sometimes it does seem impossible. 
I have to give honor to my legion of ladies, that beautiful battalion of women authors who have stood next to me and supported me in the way that women have supported women since the dawn of the dang universe. We bind wounds, we prop up, we soothe, we give advice, we hand on one another the tools that we might need to solve our particular problems. Hammers, for example, nails, compasses, sailing ships, armor, shield, and perhaps a very, very sharp knife. Specifically, and this is a small list within a broad community, Anne Ursu, Tracy Batiste, Oleg Bemisola, Rude Perkovich, Laura Ruby, Laura, Laurel Snyder, Kate Messner, and Linda Urban. Where would I be without you ladies? And I thank my lucky stars to have you in my life. I also have to express my profound gratitude to the Newberry Committee, you guys. <laughs> so first of all, I don't know if you guys know this, but they love each other <laughs> so much. And the, their care for one another is um, almost matched uh, with their care for this work. I thank you for your intelligence and care and honor for this art form, how you demonstrate through your tireless effort the fact that all of this matters. Clearly, because we're all here. This is a lot of people. All of this matters. This work matters. Each reader matters. Each book that you poured over matters. I see it, and I appreciate it. And gosh, I love you guys just as much. You guys are amazing. Thank you. I am proud to be laboring in this field with you. So I salute you. And lastly, I can't look at them right now. <laughs> I would not be here without my family. Sorry, just give me a sec. My parents who helped teach me how to understand stories, to see them from the inside and look out. My husband, who bears the singularly difficult position of being the long-suffering spouse to an only mostly sane writer and who does so with grace and strength and dedication and kindness. And this is difficult because I'm a bit of a handful. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> and to my three kids who are in the process of writing their own lives, and also in the process of rewriting the whole world. I wouldn't have become a writer without you. This is true. <laughs> They're like, see? <laughs> this is true. I certainly would not become this writer without you. You kids are my first thought and my last thought with every story. None of this would exist without you, my darlings. Thank you. Oh, there's more. Oh, okay. There's more. Phew. <laughs> so, apparently, <laughs> I won a Newberry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still astonished by it. I'm still, after all these months in this state of non-belief, it's a story, you see. One that stands in conflict with the narrative that I have created for myself, the narrative that helps me to organize my life and what I believe about my life. In the weeks that followed, that phone call at five in the morning, when I was ripped out of the deepest of deep sleeps by the voice, voices of a room full of marvelously cheerful librarians, <laughs> with their impossibly good news and me responding with garbly nonsense punctuated by the occasional how is this possible i'm still trying to accept the fact that it did in fact occur and was not simply a thing that i made up this is harder than you'd think i literally make things up for a living this is not due to any particular ambivalence about my book. In truth, I loved writing this book. I really did. 
I loved mucking about in its strangeness, its poetry and paper birds and monsters and odd magics. I loved writing through its pain and confusion and grief and hard-fought joy. I loved reading, the, weaving in those not so subtle at all super feminist undertones because that stuff never gets old. So yeah, I had a pretty good time with this one. Still, I held this deep and fundamental belief that no one else on earth was gonna like it. This is true. I thought that I was writing a book for an audience of one, that one being myself, and, um, and, and that I couldn't imagine um, the relationship that I had with this book that was so deeply personal and deeply intimate that um, that, that could be um, replicated with another reader. And in fact, I turned it in to my poor editor with a letter of apology. This is the assumption, that this assumption was part of the narrative that I lived in, part of the story that I insisted on telling myself, which meant that each time that a reviewer didn't hate it or um, each time it had inexplicably landed on a list or whatever, each time was an astonishment to me. This, this award, this speech, me standing here in front of the best looking book nerds in America? <laughs> well, it's not what I expected. And I feel as though I'm living in a story uh, that isn't mine, a narrative that I did not invent, and one that I hesitate to claim as my own. I've been telling stories my whole life, most of them outlandish most of them outrageous, most of them strange and odd and misshapen. I can't help it. I blame wiring. I blame anxiety. I blame the fact that I was an oldest child, and oldest children are typically sent out of doors with unruly younger children to entertain them, I guess. And honestly, what else are you supposed to do? I told stories. I took a small space and a small world and a small life, and I enlarged it, embiggened it, enmagicked everything. I used stories to tell the truth about the world and about myself, and I used stories to tell lies about the world and about myself. For example, <gasps> once upon a time, when I was a mousy-haired, accident-prone, socially anxious, and unbearably lonely 12-year-old with an epic Oz slash fairy tales slash Anne of Green Gables obsession, I journeyed with my three elvish companions on a magical path into a deep, dark wood. Actually, it wasn't a deep, dark wood at all. It was the scrubby leftovers from my, of my city's once great trolley line, abandoned sometime in the 50s, and which had gradually succumbed to the will of weeds and buckthorn scrub and cottonwood trees. To me, it was a wild and endless space. And my Elvish companions, the blonde children down the block that I babysat every Tuesday and 30, Thursday, believed me when I told them it was special, and they believed me when I told them it was magic, and they believed me when I told them it went on for miles and miles and miles and miles, and we had to hold hands very tightly, otherwise we might be lost forever in the thick canopy of trees. They believed me, of course, because I wanted to believe myself. We believe a thing, and it is. That is the power of stories. I told them if they stared at tree bark for long enough, they'd eventually see a map. One, sorry. Oh, they'd eventually see a map. Oh, dang. Oh. I thought I got it, rats, well, whatever. Uh, that would give them perfect directions in a certain country that does not exist on Earth. I told them that pink quartz is the buried remains of a dead gnome's heart, and that you can distract ghosts by blowing ashes in their faces. And that a sudden cool breeze was the collected spirits of dead warriors trying to remind us to be brave and bold, and kind, and righteous. 
I never knew if their mother was bothered by the endless stream of drivel that I poured into those tender ears, although, to be fair, she did stop calling me, so maybe. <laughs> Stories enlarge. They expand, they amplify, they turn sow's ears into silk purses and pig keepers into kings. A story can make a lonely, anxious kid feel more than herself for just a moment and can make an ugly, forgotten gap in a city feel like a broad, wild, and infinite space. We tell stories because we yearn for larger truths, larger experiences, larger worlds, and larger selves. We tell stories because we wish to contain multitudes, and then we do. We see the world through a wider and more complicated lens, and we can, for a little while, feel as another feels, think as another thinks, and breathe someone else's precious and magical breath. But there is another power of stories, one that well-meaning and bookish people don't always like to talk about. Stories can reveal, analyze, dis and dissect, yes, but they can also conceal, obfuscate, and distract. Stories break down barriers and reveal the nobility in ordinary people and things, but they can also turn nice old ladies into fearsome witches and neighbors into fiends. Stories create empathy, kindness, connection, and antipathy, hatred, and division. Stories are bridges and walls. Stories are bridges and walls. So what do we do about that? When I was writing this speech, I got asked a lot about politics. Are you going to talk about politics in your Newberry speech, Kelly Barnhill? This is what people asked me when, after they were able to convince me that yes, I did actually win a damn Newberry and I didn't make it up. Look, Despite, this is, despite its veneer of witches and dragons, it's a political book. It is. Of course it is. And for those of you who didn't notice its politics, um, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it's hard not to talk about politics. We are living, I don't know if you've noticed, in interesting times. And yes, all art is political. Yes, it is. And all Politics, in essence, is storytelling. All social movements, all social change, all arcs of justice, they are all storytelling. We take the narrative we are given and we retell that story in a way that better reflects the world we want to see, okay? Um, uh, human beings build meaning through narrative. We can't help it. We're wired that way. So whose stories are told and whose are silenced and why those stories are told in the first place and what we as a culture do with those stories, this matters. It's always matters. This work has always mattered. But it does sound now more than ever and we all have to pay attention. And as people who traffic in books and stories for a living, like literally everybody here, we need to show kids how to pay attention to. I wrote this book intending to wrestle with the notion of false narratives, the stories that turn neighbors into scapegoats, the stories that perpetuate intolerance, the stories that encourage us to notice the splinter in our neighbor's eye while ignoring the two by four in our own. We have all seen how minds can be opened through stories, but we have also read our history and we know the other side of that coin. We know that systemic oppression is rationalized through stories. We know that atrocities are justified through stories. We know that tyranny and intolerance are built on stories. And that's on the macro scale. On the micro scale, we see the same thing. Self-hatred is a narrative. Self-doubt is narrative. Heck, even anxiety is a narrative, is a story that we tell ourselves again and again and again and again and we can't turn off. Stories are powerful for good or bad. They can literally rewrite a person's sense of themselves and they can rewrite the world around us. 
This is what I was trying to do in The Girl Who Drank the Moon, to show how a story, when it is cynically told, can twist the truth. I wanted to show how a cynical story could become a wall, a prison, a weapon. I, and I wanted also to show how to subvert that narrative, how to reimagine and replace the stories that harm with the stories that enlarge, ennoble, and expand. And this is the role, of course, of the book. Back when I used to teach, I often told my students that a book and a story were two separate entities. A book, of course, is not a story per se, but rather it contains the tools and raw materials with we as readers construct stories. With books, we are both inside and outside. We are both participants and builders. With books, we have the tools not only to build the stories within its pages, but to rethink and rebuild the narratives that we have accepted as true, but maybe aren't. And then we can make something new. I believe this is possible. I've seen it happen, and I know you've seen it too. We live in interesting times, and we have kids who right now are deeply in need of books that will give them the tools that they need to think critically, to ask questions, to break down assumed narratives both about themselves and about the world. So yeah, we need books that are mirrors so that any kid can see themselves clearly. We need books that are bright lamps, that shine light and hope into a dark and troubled world. We need books that are bridges and roads, connecting that which we know to that which we do not. We need books that are safe harbors and welcoming sanctuaries, books that are armor and shield, friend and companion, books that free prisoners, heal the harmed, teach the ignorant, and, and feed our aching souls. Once upon a time, I was a lonely kid, an anxious kid, burdened with a false narrative, a story about myself that I told myself. It took me a long time to learn how to subvert that narrative. As book people, and I'm looking at all of you, we are all experts in subversion. Yeah, we know that books teach us to transgress, to stand up, to listen, to connect, to analyze, and to understand. I've often said that reading is an act of radical empathy, and I do believe it, but the shortened version of that statement is also true. Reading is radical. Full stop. So this is why every kid deserves a, a library. Well, first of all, so the shortened version of that sentence is also true. Every kid deserves a library. Come on. Um, especially here in Chicago. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. This is why every kid deserves a library stacked to the rafters with radical reads, books that enlarge and ennoble us, books that remind us to be brave and bold and kind and righteous, books that challenge us to face the narratives in our culture, the narratives that twist, that divide, that tell us lies about ourselves, and to break them down, look inside, analyze their working parts, and ultimately write something new. Tell a new story. Rewrite the world. Thank you. Oh my goodness, what a night. And now we're going to get wilder. <laughs> so service on the Wilder Award Committee is truly, truly a privilege and a pleasure. For an entire year, five congenial colleagues had the opportunity to delve deeply, deeply, deeply into the work of some of the most distinguished authors and illustrators of books for children. Sounds pretty heavenly, huh? The committee nominated creators of work in all genres and solicited suggestions from the ALSC membership. It soon became clear in examining the excellent caliber of work 
that our task would be as daunting as it would be delightful. We reveled in the rich illustrations of master artists, kept company with some of the finest characters ever on the page, were fascinated with nonfiction, and savored all the wise and wonderful wor words throughout. After exhaustive review and exhilarating discussion, the committee chose to honor the distinctive and varied work of Nikki Grimes. Please join me in thanking the hardworking and good-humored members of the 2017 Wilder Award Committee for their support, dedication, expertise, and commitment to task. You know the drill. Please hold your applause until they've all been named. Jula Corsaro, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight because she's in South Africa. Robin Gibson. Luann Toth and Virginia Walter. We are delighted to present this year's Laura Ingalls Wilder Award to poet, biographer, novelist, and artist, Nikki Grimes, for her substantial and lasting contribution to literature for children. Her enchantment with words emerged at an early age. Nikki was composing verse before the age of six and has been writing ever since. At the age of 13, she gave her first poetry reading at the County Colon Library in Harlem, a block away from the hospital where she was born. Since that time, she has published more than 40 novels, picture books, biographies, and volumes of poetry for a wide range of ages. Growing up in precarious circumstances, Nikki found solace in books and in the library, but she rarely found the validation she, saw, thought, she thought, sought through characters who looked like her or who had her life experience. Through the encouragement and influence of mentors and models from foster families and teachers, to James Baldwin and Julius Lester, she honed her voice and has used it to acknowledge the troubled places that children experience and provide the illumination of hope to guide them through. Via the high spirits and loyal friendships found in Denitra Brown and Di Diamond Daniel, <laughs> and the strength and dignity of Bessie Coleman and Barack Obama. Her portraits validate the struggles and successes of human existence that she yearned for in her own childhood. Her characters, whether drawn from history or her own imagination, are audacious, they are persistent, and they fill us with inspiration. But these gifts are not delivered didactically but instead with a love for the lushness of language, the artful turn of phrase, the masterful use of metaphor. She shares with us new insights that make us tingle and recognizes that poetry has a magical element in terms of slipping past the intellect. There is a surprise that touches your heart before you knew it was coming. And so it seems fitting to read one of her poems here. I can't do it as well as Ashley Gryan. <laughs> Mystery. Rich or poor, we all own two tiny treasures. Worthless if saved, they are priceless when, when spent. What are they? Thank you. Nikki Grimes, please accept our very deepest gratitude and the 2017 Laura Ingalls Wilder Medal for your substantial and lasting contribution to literature for children.
when I first uh, got into this business, um, the stories and poems that I wrote tended to be very dark, very heavy. And time and time again, editors would tell me, besides telling me to lighten up, <laughs> they would tell me, um, these stories are not age appropriate. Which I found difficult to process because the stories that I was drawing from were from my own childhood. So how could they not be age appropriate for children? Very complicated to process that. So I thought about what truth can I pull from my life, from my childhood, um, that would in fact be age appropriate for readers of any age. And that single truth that I could always return to is hope. I know a lot about hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen is one of my favorite verses in scripture. Largely because the word hoped is featured. I've had a lifelong fascination with words and the word with the deepest resonance for me is hope. Hope, the golden key which mysteriously lets us into the hall of dreams. The journey that brought me to this moment would have been cut short without hope. To begin, I must confess that I never planned a career in children's literature. A life of letters was always part of my equation, but my professional path began by writing for those aliens called adults. <laughs> I spent years freelancing for periodicals like Soho Weekly News and the Amsterdam News, and then moved on to write poetry and features for Ms. and Essence Magazine, among others. In the late 60s and early 70s, I performed my poetry at coffee houses during open mic and eventually became part of the regular lineup of the last Poets Coffee House and the New Yorkian Puerto Ricans Poets Cafe. I attended a writing workshop at Columbia where I met Nikki Giovanni and moved in circles that included poets Sonia Sanchez and Quincy Troop and short story writer Tony K. Bambara. I published poetry in adult literary journals like Callaloo, Drum, and the Greenfield Review, edited by one Joseph Bruchak. We go back a long ways. <laughs> and later hit the college circuit, reading my poetry alongside Giovanni, Amiri Baraka, and Jane Cortez. Of course, it's a miracle that I even got that far. A child at risk from a broken home, I banged around from one foster home to another for years. When my mother remarried and I went back to live with her, I had to survive the turmoil of her alcoholism and mental illness and my stepfather's abuse. In all those years, writing was my survival tool. And for me, hope was not a feather, but more a lifeline. God helped me to hold on tight. I had human help as well. There was my 10th grade English teacher, Evelyn Wexler, a Holocaust survivor who taught me that I could rise above my circumstances and who gave me my first B minus on a composition. <laughs> a B minus. I was appalled and demanded an explanation. If you want an A plus in my class, she informed me, you'll have to dig in and do the very best writing of which you're capable. Well, as my Jewish friends would say, she did me a great mitzvah, teaching me that good enough isn't, and that I should always seek to raise the bar in my own work, and I've been doing that ever since. Then there was James Baldwin, my favorite author, who mentored me for a year and a half during a brief stay in America. With their help and the encouragement of my sister, I went on to finish high school and eventually college. 
By the time I was in my 20s, I was on a clear trajectory to create collections of poetry and short stories for adults. I remember discussing one particular project with Toni Morrison while she was still an editor at Random House. She believed in my talent and was an enormous source of encouragement. Little wonder I dreamed of someday penning the great American novel for which I would win the Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> of course, to be quickly followed by the Nobel. <laughs> she beat me to it. <laughs> Little Nikki had, had no shortage of ego, my friends. <laughs> of course, all this was before I entered the realm of children's literature. I had a couple of ideas for books for children, and my thinking was that dash them off because, as we all know, writing books for children is so easy. <laughs> yeah. Afterwards, I'd go back to working on the great American novel. It's okay to laugh at my plans. God certainly did. <laughs> Though I didn't hear him at the time, I was too busy figuring out how the children's book market worked. To do that, I reviewed children's books for several book review services, including what was then known as the Bulletin of the Council on Interracial Books for Children. Brad Chambers was the head honcho back then. And once I figured out that Dial was the publisher most likely to be interested in the kinds of stories I wanted to write, I started bugging Brad to arrange an introduction with the one and only Phyllis Fogelman. Brad thought the idea was preposterous, of course, and tried to convince me to submit my work to a more junior editor. Well, I wasn't interested in any of that. <laughs> I'd already gotten it into my head that if I were going to be rejected, I wanted to be from the person at the top. When Brad wasn't able to dissuade me, he suggested a senior editor, but I still wouldn't bite. Did I mention my stubbornness from a young age? <laughs> well, I needled and needled poor Brad until he finally caved and put in a call to Phyllis. He was shocked when Phyllis agreed to look at my work and even more surprised when she eventually called me in for a meeting. At that point, I had a collection of what I thought were short stories about a friendship between a girl named Pump, short for pumpkin, and a boy named Jim Jim. Phyllis liked what she saw, but said more stories were needed and suggested that perhaps I could come up with some thread that would connect them all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how Phyllis Fogelman got me to write a novel without ever using the word. <laughs> In 1977, Growing, my debut book for young readers, was born. My second book, Something on My Mind, with art by Tom Feelings, was equally important because it was my first collection of poetry for children. My father had once taken me to an art exhibit featuring Tom Feelings and Leo Cardi, two of his favorite artists. And so I was familiar with Tom's work, he and Leo were raising money at the time to join Maya Angelou and other artists, African-American artists, working in Ghana. And the sales from that exhibit were to go towards their travel expenses. Years later, I popped in to visit radio producer Pepsi Charles in New York, a good friend of mine. Pepsi regularly read my poetry on air. And when I dropped by her home one day, she and a gentleman were busily poring over my work. The gentleman turned out to be Tom Feelings. Somewhere, I felt my father smiling. Would I be interested in writing poems to accompany his art for a new book, he asked me. Well, I feigned indifference, <laughs> trying to look cool. But inside, I was jumping up and down. I made no commitment, but told him I'd consider the project. That consideration eventually morphed into something on my mind. Many books have followed since, and I'm long past planning a career 
in books for adults. And guess what? God's not laughing anymore. Instead, he's smiling because I've taken the hope he planted inside me and I've carefully wrapped it in age-appropriate lyrical language <laughs> to share with young readers as sorely in need of hope as I once was. The world is a difficult and a dangerous place these days, and our children need all the wonder, beauty, and hope we can offer. We all have a part in this critical work. Thanks to committee chair Star Latronica and all the members of the 2017 Laura Ingalls Wilder Award Committee for this honor. Thanks to my foster brother Kendall Buchanan for being here tonight, representing the family who gave me a loving and secure home in which my writing life could begin. Thanks to Agent Elizabeth Harding, my cheerleader in chief. Thanks to special friends from childhood and newer friends who come to cheer me on tonight. Thanks to the many editors who helped me to make my books the very best that they can be. And thanks to all of you for putting those books into the hands of the children who need them. God has blessed me richly, and I hope he will in turn bless all of you. Thank you. <laughs>